One of my favorite parts of sky watching, what I really love to think about when I'm out there under a completely dark sky with thousands of stars up above, is to contemplate the depth in that night sky of how we're not just looking at things that are a little bit far away or very far away. We are looking at stuff incredibly far away. And if you pick one particular direction, how the universe just goes and goes and goes in that direction. And in that direction, you never know what you might encounter that the universe might have to offer. For example, for example, if you look in the direction of the constellation Sagittarius, you're looking in a very special direction in the sky. You're actually looking towards the center of our Milky Way galaxy, towards the center of the, our home galaxy itself. The dense collection of stars and nebula, the, the central bulge, the central bar, the whole thing like a vast complex structure and you can you can see it like you can't see it with your eyeballs it's kind of tough but you can look in the direction of the center of the milky way galaxy and there's something special hidden in the center of the milky way galaxy our milky way has a secret it has a dark black heart in fact, we suspect that almost every galaxy in the universe hosts a dark black heart. And in this case, when you look in the direction of the constellation Sagittarius, buried in there amongst the millions of stars in our galactic core, near the very center is a monster, a black hole. A black hole not a garden variety, backyard, stellar mass black hole that's a few times the mass of the sun or a few dozen times the mass of the sun. I'm talking about a black hole four million times more massive than the sun, the largest black hole in the entire Milky Way galaxy. And right now, this black hole is quiet. It's sleepy. It's just laying there in the shadows. But there is some material, some gas and dust falling into that black hole. Slowly, nothing, nothing dramatic, but inch by inch, there's material coalescing around that black hole, and that material is screaming. The first person to notice this was Carl Jansky himself, the father or one of the fathers of radio astronomy. And he noticed this way back in the 1930s. He found he, with a steerable radio array that let him pinpoint the direction of where radio sources might come from, he was able to pick out all sorts of stuff. One of the biggest things he was able to spot with this specific frequency range of his radio array was thunderstorms. Thunderstorms emit radio emissions. He was able to pick it up. He was able to classify nearby thunderstorms. He was able to pick, a, pick out far away thunderstorms. And there was this weird background hiss, this weird background radio signal that he couldn't connect to any thunderstorm close or far, any source on the earth. It must have been coming from space. And initially he thought maybe it came from the sun, but he would hear the hiss during the night, so that was out. And over the course of months of dedicated observations, he was able to figure out where this radio source was coming from. And it turns out it came from the center of our Milky Way galaxy. It came from Sagittarius. And by this time, astronomers had already figured out that Sagittarius was the direction of the center of the Milky Way galaxy. There was a denser collection of stars in that direction. And if you map out globular clusters, they seem to orbit around that part of the Milky Way itself. So there were, Carl Jansky figured out that something funny was happening with the constellation Sagittarius with the center of our galaxy. 
But he went back to work, you know, he, he didn't really know what to make of it. No one really paid attention to the results. There was this thing called the Depression in World War II that kind of got in the way of scientific research at the time. But eventually radio astronomy came back in the, in the 50s and 60s. And people started building better arrays, better radio telescopes, better dishes, mapping the sky. They found Carl Jansky's source again, still didn't quite know what to make of it. But they also found other sources, incredibly bright radio sources dotted across the sky, hundreds of them. And they didn't really know what to make of it. What are, what are these sources of incredibly strong radio emission? And it took a while to match one of one of these radio sources because the resolution wasn't all that great. So they could, they could just say like, in this vague patch of sky, there's a very loud radio source. But eventually they were able to match it up with an optical image, a visible image, that was in the same patch of sky. And this source was called 3C273, if you're curious. And when they looked at the optical image of this object, it was incredibly bright and incredibly small. It looked like a star. Like seriously, it looked like a star. If you just look at a star, they're known for being very small and very bright. This object was very small and very bright, and it was re emitting a ridiculous amount of radio emission. Eventually we got a spectrum of that light source. So we were able to figure out the elemental composition of whatever's generating that light. And it had all the familiar stuff, hydrogen, helium, lithium, you know, all the good stuff, carbon, oxygen, but it was shifted. Everything was in the wrong place. And the only way to explain that is something we'd realized long before was that this object, whatever it is, this 3C273 must be incredibly far away. It's incredibly far away and it's generating strong radio emission. It's very bright and it's about 2.4 billion light years away. 2.4 billion light years away. It's small, it's bright, and it's loud. The intensity of the radiation coming from this object, this object in particular, 3C273, is ridiculous. Like it, it's so hard to come up with the right superlatives to describe what is going on with the star, just how intense this source is. It's so intense, it's so intense that if you were to put it in our stellar neighborhood, like say, I don't know, like 40 light years away, all right, which is a pretty decent distance, right? Other stars that are 40 light years away are just tiny points of light. This thing, if it were 40 light years away, it would outshine the sun. That's how bright it is. It is four trillion times more luminous than our own sun. What is going on? What is going on? We, at the time, we had no clue. So we gave it a cool name. It was called a quasi-stellar radio source. All right, it's a source of intense radio waves, radio source, and it kind of sort of looks like a star because it's small and very bright. So, but we know it's not a star, so it's quasi-stellar. This was shortened to quasar because quasar sounds super cool and who could resist passing up an opportunity to coin a term like that? So qu the term quasar was born. Over time, we've discovered more quasars all over the place, thousands of them, and all of them are far away, hundreds of millions of light years, while most are incredibly far away, like billions of light years away. So what's going on? What, what is sourcing something this powerful, something this distant? Well, whatever it is, it has to be small. Because when we look at these sources, they're not constant, they're not steady, they'll vary in brightness. They'll get a little bit brighter, they'll get a little bit dimmer, you know, they'll change. And we can use the timing of those changes to tell us the size of the object or the maximum size of the object. And it works like this. Let's say you look at this distant object and it changes its brightness over the course of a year. For example, in one year, you, you 
take an image and a year later you take another image and it has a different brightness. Well, that means this object can't be bigger than one light year across because everybody in that object, whatever it's made of, has to get all coordinated so that they can all change their brightness, they can all communicate, they can all, all the physics can mix together inside of that object in order to produce a change on those kind of timescales. Well, we see changes in some of these quasars in as little as a week, which means the object can't be more than a light week across. That's small. That's small. For something generating this amount of light, that's like nothing. That's peanuts. And whatever it is has to be incredibly massive. Because if you, if you thought it was just a star or just a cloud of gas hanging out, there's not enough oomph. There's not enough energy there. There's not enough raw horsepower to drive something that bright in something that's not massive. So it has to be incredibly massive and it has to be incredibly small. What could these quasars be? Well, let's think back to what's going on in the center of our own Milky Way. Around at about the same time, it slowly dawned on us that the center of the Milky Way is a giant black hole, right? This four million solar mass black hole, it's named Sagittarius A star, by the way. It's generating radio emission powered by this black hole. Maybe these quasars are also gigantic black holes sitting in other galaxies emitting like crazy. But how can that work? How, what's the physics behind this? Well, imagine you have a giant black hole. And by the way, for object uh, 3C273, this quasar that was identified, one of the earliest, the earliest confirmed quasar, it's estimated to have a black hole um, 800 million times more massive than the sun. 800 million times more massive than the sun. A black hole. That's a big black hole. These are called supermassive black holes, by the way, because they're uh, large. So what's going on? What are the physics here? If you take a black hole, it has very strong gravity. Duh. And if you take a blob of gas and dust, you know, it's just hang along, doing its thing, roaming around the galaxy, and then encounters the black hole because it's at the center of the galaxy. Lots of stuff likes to fall into the center of the galaxy. So boom, it encounters the black hole. What does it do? It's going to fall into the black hole. It's going to accrete. So what is that going to do? All this material that's occupying a big volume is going to get crammed into this little tiny, relatively speaking, tiny black hole. Well, what happens when you take a gas and you squeeze its volume down? Its temperature increases. Hmm? With hotter temperature, you get more luminosity. There's lots of frictional heating. There's lots of release of gravitational potential energy. You drive up the temperature, it starts glowing. And this is what we think causes the emission from a quasar is gas falling in, actively falling into a black hole, cramming into a small volume, like trying to shove a bunch of people into a little subway car. It's going to get hot and sweaty and uncomfortable. And that's what happens to the gas. It falls in, it heats up, and it glows intensely brightly, which we pick out as a quasar. When do black holes feed? Well, obviously the Milky Way's black hole, Sagittarius A star, isn't actively feeding right now, or at least a little bit. There's always a little bit of gas falling onto a black hole, lighting it up a little, but it's certainly not in the quasar mode, otherwise we may have noticed already. So what's powering it? We think it has something to do with galaxy mergers. When galaxies merge, the black holes contained in each galaxy find each other, merge together, make a bigger black hole. And then there's all sorts of tidal disruptions. So there's uh, gas clouds being ripped apart, shoved apart, given weird orbits. And a lot of gas is going to accumulate in the center of the newly merged galaxy. And when it's there, it's going to funnel itself down into that black hole and it's going to light up and it's going to be bright enough that we can see it from literally across the universe. 
we think, we're pretty sure there's a connection between galaxy mergers and quasar activity. It's a little bit tough because you know it's a statistical relationship, the stuff is pretty far away, but that's our best guess, that there is a, a direct connection. And that's why we don't think modern day quasars are really a thing because galaxies don't merge as often as they do than in, in the past. In the past, when the universe was smaller and structures were still forming from smaller bits, galaxies were just now getting their game on, lots of mergers, lots of quasars. We see lots of quasars in the distant universe, which is the younger universe. Today, things are a little bit more settled, a little bit more quiet down, not nearly as many quasars. Will Andromeda and Milky Way, Andromeda are the nearest neighbor to the Milky Way, we're on a collision course. We're gonna merge in about five billion years. Will that trigger a quasar? Probably, in which case, it'll be interesting. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please click the like button and the subscribe and the notification, do all the stuff, and please consider contributing to Patreon. There's a button right there, patreon.com slash pmsutter. It's how I'm able to keep making this show possible. Thank you so much for watching.